so this evening, it's a, it's a business dinner, it's in the Highlands. Um, your background's in sport. What, what's the connection? What are you going to be telling people? Well, gee whiz, what can, I, what can I possibly tell a community of business people? I don't know. I don't know what they'll get from it. But again, I think it goes back to our earlier discussion Ian, about, uh, about real life stories which hopefully resonate to a wider community. And you have a huge number of businesses represented at this dinner. There's over 350 people coming from a huge back number of backgrounds. And I hope that my story will resonate with them about the changing face of my business in televised sport. That is my business. It has been for 33 years. Uh, and I've seen a, a massive change, not just in terms of the communications potential that there has been. When I first started in television, I start, I, it was a huge clunky studio. There were five cameras, massive things, all wielded around and wheeled around by big burly guys. Uh, there was a silence on the floor. Uh, we had, there was an autocue which was fed by hand on what was like a, like a toilet roll that was typed upon and large amount of tipex on it, all that sort of stuff. Now. I don't use an auto queue. Never have. I can use one if required, but we don't use it the, the way I work. Um, and I found myself on a beach in Gold Coast, Australia, last year at the Commonwealth Games, with a satellite pack in a shopping trolley, uh, connected by a wireless earpiece, twelve thousand miles away to our base in Manchester. And I broadcast for five hours from a beach in all weathers coming back and forward and hitting me all over the place, bringing guests to the beach, sitting them on a beach mat and doing this all al fresco. Now, in 33 years, I could never have imagined the change and the incredible potential of broadcasting in terms of connecting the world. But not just that, that's the change in, in the technology available, but the change in the demographic within the industry has been, I mean, completely mind-blowing mm. to such an extent that this summer, um, I'm working uh, for the BBC on the World Cup of Netball. Uh, now, you cannot get a ticket for the World Cup of Netball. It's in Liverpool's Echo Arena. And since England won the gold medal at the Commonwealth Games last year, netball's profile has whoosh gone like that. Now, I've, I've worked on netball for 30 years. And I actually did the, world, the last World Championship to be staged here about 25 years ago in Birmingham. And, and in that broadcast, I, I presented it, I commentated on it, and I did all the interviews because it was a very small staff. Now, it's a huge, huge, it's a big deal. We're sharing a broadcast with Sky, we're having live matches every day, and it's part of a summer of sport which has been marketed as change the game. So we're changing, we're changing the, the whole impetus of broadcast sport. It's not just guys who can become professional sportsmen. Women can become professional sportswomen now in a huge variety of sports, from football, Scotland going back to a World Cup at last. I've waited a long time for that. We've got the netball. We've got Wimbledon. We've got the World Athletics. There's so much more. We've got the Ashes. And it's all being marketed as a whole bunch of world-class sports which just happen to be being played by professional women. Now, that is... I mean, it's a total sea change from the broadcasting world I came into. So it just shows you the revolution that can happen in any industry within a matter of 30 years. And I hope that that story um, and my involvement in it will resonate with industries around here that will be going through similar changes. That's my message. Are there any kind of obvious parallels or, or lessons to be learned from you know, elite athletes, professional sports people from a business perspective? Yes, preparation, preparation, preparation. Um, and <laughs> It's just, it's sheer hard work, but it's not giving up. It's, it's all of these cliches that you hear about sport, but I've met so many people for whom it is lived. They live by those rules. Um, Amy Williams, who won a, a gold medal in skeleton uh, in Vancouver's Winter Games 2010, she went through four years of preparation for those games, asking herself every time she went out, if I eat that, is that gonna help me win a gold medal? No, I'm not going to eat it. She never had an ice cream or a piece of chocolate for four years. Now, that, that's, that's really at the extreme end of it. But that's the length to which people will go to succeed. And that's the one lesson that I've taken from ooh, a long number of years in sport, is seeing the utter, absolute conviction 
and self-belief in people who want to succeed at something. And there's no shortcuts. That's the other big, big lesson I've learned from it. There ain't no shortcuts. If you don't do the work, you will not succeed. Um, so I think that's been my mantra within it. I've always worked really hard. I'm a bit of, a, of an anorak. Um, I'm renowned as a bit of an anorak. Uh, but I love preparation. I love my research. And I can't go to an event without feeling that I have done everything in my power to have learned about the sport that I'm doing. I, I very, very rarely wing it. Um, and I think hopefully that's a message that, that comes through as well. If, if you fail to prepare, prepare to fail.